Well, welcome. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you today. I am very uh, excited about our session. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Gassman, and I'm the uh, Associate Dean for Research and also a faculty member at Rutgers University's Graduate School of Education. And we are excited to uh, have you with us today. Uh, this event is sponsored by the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers, which you should definitely check out. Uh, the name of the event is the Youth Empowerment Paradox, the Politics of Education and Youth Leadership in a Time of Uprising. And we have an absolutely wonderful speaker with us today who is one of our amazing faculty at Rutgers GSE, Crystal Strong, who is an assistant professor of Black Studies in Education. I want to say welcome, Crystal, before I read your bio. Thank you so much for being with us today. And um, Crystal is, an, uh, as I said, an assistant professor of Black Studies in Education. And she holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley. And her research uses ethnographic, participatory, and multimodal methods to investigate youth and community activism, global Black social movements, and the role of education as a site of struggle in the African diaspora. Her first book project, which is currently in progress and I can't wait to see, is called Apprentices to Power, Students and the Anti-Radicalism of Leadership in Nigeria After Democracy. And it is an ethnography of post-military university student politics and the trappings of leadership after Nigeria's transition to democracy. So uh, welcome, Crystal. We are thrilled to have you here. Just so that everyone knows, uh, Crystal will be taking questions. So please put them in the Q&A. And we will, uh, after her talk, we will be uh, having a moderated discussion. She's really eager to answer your questions. So please, please ask them as you go along. All right, Crystal, I'm handing it over to you. And I am really excited to learn from you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Gassman, for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here with you all today, and I'm looking forward to sharing my talk, which is called The Youth Empowerment pa Paradox. So over the past decade, we've seen young people catalyzing global movements around educational, racial, and environmental, and other forms of social justice. And part of what I talk about in my work is how education has played a very important, though perhaps underappreciated role in these struggles. So part of what I'm going to be talking about today is two educational contexts that are harnessing and amplifying youth power. The first is youth leadership development, and the second is school-based protests. And this is based on transnational research that I've conducted over the past six years. As I will argue, the political stakes of contemporary schooling are high. And as educators, global citizens, and youth advocates, we must interrogate the social and political impact of seeming youth empowerment for a rising generation of youth making important demands for social change. So let me tell you a little bit about today's roadmap and where we're going. We're going to start out with an open letter from South Africa as a way of entering into this work. Um, I'm going to zoom out to contextualize what I mean by youth power. Um, and then I'll talk about the different contexts for youth leadership. The first is institutionalized youth leadership development, and the second is school protests. And then I will end by sharing a little bit more about what I mean by the youth empowerment paradox. So let's start with a story. What do I mean by the youth empower empowerment paradox? Uh, part of what you're seeing here is uh, in this photo is an image of the African Leadership Academy, which is a private high school in Johannesburg, South Africa. In October of 2018, I attended an educator workshop at the African Leadership Academy. This school opened in 2007, and the Leadership Academy has declared a very ambitious mission of transforming leadership in Africa through education. The school is a two-year high school, but it is also a major player in global educational enterprises and youth leadership development, for which it has won a number of awards. So it's a big-time player here. 
So part of what the Leadership Academy does is it offers a week-long professional development course on the school's pedagogical model, which it calls entrepreneurial leadership. I attended this PD with about 20 African educators who teach in schools and nonprofits across the continent. And it was on day three of this professional development that we encountered an open letter written by a student and signposted on bulletin boards and columns in high traffic areas around the school. Addressed to the American CEO and co-founder of the school, Mr. Bradford, here's what the letter said. Is this school seeking to form leaders or achievers? At first, this school tried to keep to its mission to enable lasting peace and prosperity in Africa by developing and connecting the continent's future leaders. However, this school has become an achievers factory. Where are the people who intend to bring change in Africa? It continued. We pushed students toward universities in the West and becoming part of elite networks of power rather than transformative community-based leadership. That brings up doubt if you are creating people who think for themselves or people that fit in your definition of success according to the Leadership Academy's politicized education. So as you might imagine, this is the kind of moment that an ethnographer like myself lives for because the letter unsettles the celebratory institutional discourse around the school's impact and reveals points of contestation. Now, what I'm interested in signaling to you is the tension contained within the letter between, on the one hand, the seemingly benevolent mission of the high school to, quote unquote, develop the next generation of African leaders, and on the other hand, the more complicated politics of this mission when examined within a global terrain of power and struggle. What this student calls becoming part of elite networks of power versus transformative community-based leadership. So while the fallout from the open letter was playing out, these very real tensions were being articulated in another educational context within Johannesburg at the University of Witwatersrand, or WITS. Three weeks earlier in September, the Fees Must Fall students movement was reignited with the decision of the South African Minister of Education to increase tuition rates for public institutions by a whopping 8%. Led by students since 2015, Fees Must Fall has advanced demands for free and decolonized education for youth of the born free generation who are coming of age after the end of legal apartheid. At WITS, student occupations of the campus escalated with violence as police and private security attacked students with rubber bullets, stun grenades, and water cannons. Student protests and property damage in response to this state violence forced the closure of this and other campuses for many days. So I want to direct your attention to the slide here. Um, there were other visuals that I could have chosen to represent this particular struggle, right? There were images of students organizing, um, images of students, um, in, in fact, the image here is, is a response to state violence from the authorities. You see a young person holding a rock, but this kind of decontextualized imagery is part of the framing of this form of youth activism and leadership. As you'll see with the New York Times um, headline and caption for this image, which reads that students at WITS threw stones on Tuesday as nationwide protests demanding free tertiary education dragged on in Johannesburg. So part of my intention here is to show the juxtaposition on the one hand of this sort of institutionalized form of youth leadership development. And then on the other hand, this form of grassroots rebellion led by young people who are demanding meaningful truly structural forms of social transformation. And if you look at the image of the young person on the left side who is holding a rock, he's wearing a t-shirt that says, the revolution will be educated. So a big 
part of what I'm trying to get at here and to understand here is what is the relationship between these two forms of youth leadership that are taking place within and around educational institutions? And so within my broader research agenda around youth leadership, I explore how the two settings I've just described represent two kinds of educational contexts and political processes that are cultivating young leaders, not just across Africa, but around the world, in fact. I explore the first context, which the Leadership Academy represents through the study that you see um, represented on the left side of the slide, um, the African Youth Leadership Study. And in this work, I investigate the politics and impact of the institutionalization of African youth leadership development globally. And I use ethnographic fieldwork, interviews, surveys, and digital mapping to do so. In the second context, which you see pictured on the right, I explore um, school protests in Africa, which is part of what the Fees Must Fall protest that I just described represents. In this work, I track and digitally map the role of schools and school actors in contemporary protests in Africa after the year 2000 using archival and social media research methods. And today I'll be talking a little bit about both projects. Ultimately, a big part of what I'm trying to understand here is what are the social effects of institutionalizing youth leadership in this in the way that we see in the African Leadership Academy in a time of global uprisings similar to the fees must fall protests ultimately i make the case that institutionalized youth leadership and grassroots youth activism are i argue that they articulate competing political logics competing educational praxis and ultimately competing visions of social transformation My interests in youth leadership are informed by a broader global turn to youth and also the positive youth development movement, which has shifted research policy and practice from pathologizing views of youth to asset-based views of youth. However, I want to lay out some context for the specific significance of why I'm focusing on African youth leadership in this moment. So I want you to take a look at the slide that is currently imaged. What you see here is a representation of where global youth live. And as you can see very clearly, Africa has the largest, fastest growing youth population in the world. Africa is a young continent. 70% of the population is under the age of 30. And by 2050, one out of every four youth around the world will be African. At the same time that we see this sort of trend of a young continent, there's also a counter pattern of old leadership. While, as I mentioned, the under 30 population is a, a significant portion of the total population, the African continent also has the oldest group of leaders around the world. On average, only 15 to 21% of the population of African nations was even alive when their presidents took office. This dynamic is a key source of political change and activism in the, re in the region. And in fact, in the past decade, there have been movements for regime change against these old leaders in more than half of all African countries, which is significant. So what you're seeing here is another map that shows how African leadership is currently an old boys club, right? And so you'll see that Africa is home to the world's longest ruling heads of state. Since 1960, 14 presidents have held office for more than 30 years. And we're also seeing that military coups and movements for regime change are on the rise currently after decades of decline. And so my work on youth who are being institutionally groomed for leadership and youth who are developing their power through rebellion sits right at this intersection of a young continent with a significant population of old leaders. So I want to talk a little bit about how I come to this work. And how I come to this work is through long-term ethnographic research in Nigeria, 
is which is what ultimately led me to this larger transit transnational research on African youth leadership development. So over the past 15 years in Nigeria, I've lived on higher education campuses and researched student leadership and activism. This is the focus of my first book project, Apprenticeship to Apprentices to Power, which um, as Dr. Gassman mentioned, is a multi-sided ethnography of student politics and the trappings of leadership after the transition from military to civilian rule. In Nigeria and throughout the entire continent of Africa and through in around most parts of the world, Students have been historically the most powerful organized group in the nation. And part of what I found in my research is that student leaders in the so-called democratic era were quite ambivalent and conflicted about how they thought social change would or could take place. In my work at the University of Ibadan, which you see pictured here, which is Nigeria's first university, students were quite torn about whether they should continue agitating against the state and protesting against the state through activism as students had done for decades under military rule, or if they should try working within the system through elected leadership. And so part of what I'm um, pointing out here is, is that in my work on the ground in educational institutions, young people were really grappling with the idea of whether they should try to contest the state, contest the sort of old boys network of power, or if they should try joining the system. Since graduating, about a dozen members of the group of young people and student leaders that I worked with, who I've maintained relationships with over the past 15 years, I noticed that they were participating in global leadership development programs that were specifically targeting African youth. One former student by the name of Faith became a recruiter for the African Leadership Academy, the high school that I discussed a moment ago, and that's actually how I learned about the institution. Another former student who's pictured in this slide, Timmy Olagunju, he was in the 2015 cohort of the Young African Leadership Initiative, which was established by Barack Obama in 2010. Timmy wrote a book entitled Yes, Africa Can, which you see on the slide here. And the book talks about his experiences in the program, and he offers advice to other young leaders who are looking for leadership development opportunities. After his experience with youth leadership development, he actually lobbied for the passage of a law called Not Too Young to Run, which was intended to lower the age of office seekers to create more space for young people in the government. And then in 2018, he unsuccessfully ran for the Federal House of Representatives. Yet another student by the name of Jibula, he received a scholarship for young African leaders to get a graduate degree in South Africa. And I want you to remember this young man's name because I will come back to him very soon. So all of this is to say that my interest in examining institutionalized and oppositional forms of African youth leadership, it developed quite organically in the context of this long-term embedded research and my relationships with young people with aspirations for leadership. So in 2016, I began to develop the African Youth Leadership Study to see if what I was ethnographically observing in Nigeria was a part of a broader phenomenon of institutionalized African youth leadership development. And I wanna give you a broad overview of this study before taking a deeper dive into what I've learned through this work about the politics and impact of African youth leadership development and how young people experience leadership development. So what you see on the right here is um, an image of the cafeteria of the African Leadership Academy. You see all of the uh, flags of the um, African nations around the world. It's a very pan-African space. Um, and part of what I intended to uh, seek to understand with the African Youth Leadership Study was first, I wanted to, to understand more about the global landscape of African youth leadership development. And secondly, I wanted to understand young people's experiences. And so I did that through um, database creation, you know, mapping all of the leadership development programs that I could find. 
um, but also interviewing young people, interviewing them, conducting focus groups, conducting surveys, and actually doing ethnographic field work in these sites of leadership development. You can actually learn more about this work if you would like at the research website where some of this data is available, africanyouthleadershipstudy.com. So I must say that this work would not be possible without an amazing team of student research collaborators, which has included graduate and undergraduate students, most of whom have direct connections to youth leadership development, or they identify personally as African youth. Over the past six years, these have been my co-conspirators and collaborators in this work. Um, you'll remember the young Nigerian Jibala, who I asked you to remember. Please note that he became a research collaborator in this work, and he's pictured on the top slide. And so now I want to pivot to sharing some of what I'm discovering through this research. I first began by trying to understand the phenomenon. I knew some of the individual stories of young people pursuing leadership development, like Timmy, like Jibola. But at the time, there was very little research I could find about African youth leadership development beyond the analysis of individual initiatives. And so this work also assumed, the work that I did find, it assumed that youth leadership development had a positive social impact. So there were simply not many critical perspectives. So I sought to get a lay of the land. And my strategy for doing that, so to speak, was to map quite literally, African youth leadership development. This was an iterative, multi-phase process of defining African youth leadership development, figuring out how to locate these programs, creating a robust database where no data existed, and developing an interactive, searchable digital map and research website, which you see pictured here. The site, AfricanYouthLeadershipStudy.com, is designed with African youth researchers and practitioners in mind. You can learn about youth leadership initi initiatives on the site. You can also contribute initiatives that have not been included, and you can also participate in the study. So far, what we found is that, it, you know, through this database and mapping process is we've discovered, um, or we've um, identified, I should say, 277 unique leadership initiatives that meet the following criteria of inclusion. First, they target African youth. Two, they offer some sort of educational training. Three, they are quite explicitly attempting to cultivate leaders. And then four, they have a mission related to African development. And so, in addition to helping us to understand where these forms of leadership development are happening, we also found that there are hubs of youth leadership development investment, which you see listed at the bottom. So South Africa is a huge hub for youth leadership development activities. You may or may not be surprised to learn that the US is a major player in African youth leadership development, and then a number of other African countries that have large populations, Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, Ghana, and then there are also other foreign governments that are investing a lot of resources into uh, young people's leadership in the, on the African continent, and that's the UK and also China. So in short, the first phase of this work confirmed a global ecosystem of actors and institutions within and beyond the African continent that are pouring billions of dollars into grooming African youth for leadership. This includes governments, this includes multilateral institutions, this includes non-governmental, corporate, and philanthropic institutions and actors who have both public and private interests in African leadership. And one of the things that was very important to note is that 80% of these programs have been established in the past decade. So part of what I want you to understand of emphasis on youth leadership development and the investment, the substantial investment in it is quite a recent phenomenon. And some of what I'll be describing is, is to help us understand why this emphasis on youth leadership development why this emphasis on youth empowerment. And so my next step after getting the lay of the land was to try to understand these programs on their own terms. 
what is it that they say they're doing and how are they doing it? How are they approaching African youth leadership development pedagogically, philosophically, ideologically, organizationally? So my student collaborators and I collected all of the available data that we could find on, on these programs mission, on their pedagogy, on how they determine eligibility, the selection process, the program design, the organizational stru structures, you name it, what we could find, we attempted to analyze it. So this is a table that provides an overview of the data that we collected and analyzed. And so I'm not going to go into all of the details of this, this table at this moment, um, but the short version is that my research team and I identified six major organizational approaches through which this youth leadership development is taking place. Short-term programs, scholarships and grants, brick and mortar institutions like schools, conferences are another place where youth leadership development is happening, the creation of networks, especially online networks, and then online learning were the major ways that youth leadership development is being offered to young people and invested in. And there's a lot more that I could say about this, but I'll just share a few highlights for our discussion here. So one of the primary um, ways that, that um, this gr global ecosystem of actors is investing in youth leadership development in Africa and beyond Africa is through these short-term programs where they invite young leaders to gain some sort of training um, in, in leadership development. And so one example of, of this kind of programming is the Equity Leaders Program, which notes that it is empowering a continent by creating better livelihoods through education. So some of what we found about these short-term programs is that about 42% of the young people that we surveyed, or 96 youth, they had participated in short-term programs in 21 different countries around the world. And part of what they noted in our surveys of them is that it was these programs that helped them gain some kind of mobility. These programs facilitated their travel within their home countries. 60% of them got opportunities to travel within their home countries. A third of them got an opportunity to travel within their regions. And then about 36% of them were enabled to travel outside of the African continent. And so what I want you to hold on to about this is that part of what short-term programs are doing is they are providing these mobility opportunities for young people with leadership aspirations. Another form of youth leadership development that was highly represented in our study was scholarships and grants, which is probably the oldest form, the most historic and established form of investing in young people's leadership. Um, Scholarships and grants, as you might imagine, involve um, providing uh, resources, financial assistance um, for the purpose of people attending schools or starting uh, businesses. And so one example, one very prominent example, I should say, is the MasterCard Foundation, which scholars program um, that is specifically attempting to develop Africa's next generation of leaders. And you see here a brief description on the slide about what they're trying to do. Um, they suggest that they want to allow students who have talent and promise to, to um, gain access to the financial resources that they need to complete their education. They offer academic support. And so, as you might imagine, this is tremendously transformative for young people who may lack certain kinds of financial resources for educational access. However, when we talked to young leaders who had access to scholarships and grant programs that were specifically targeting young people who have leadership aspirations, they had a lot of questions. And one of the questions that one of our um, youth leader respondents uh, suggested to us in interviews is the following. They noted, it's as if these programs are just looking at young talent, and after they get it, what happens to the people? And so as I'll share it further in a moment, part of what the young leaders um, were grappling with was the fact that 
these scholarship and grant programs for youth leadership, they provided opportunities that were very beneficial, but they didn't quite always understand what the, the, the larger intentions for these programs were and what they intended for the young people who they sought after. And then finally, um, in addition to the short-term programs, in addition to scholarships and grants, schools are one of the primary ways that we see youth leadership development being offered. And one very prominent example, perhaps one of um, the, the first in this sort of new generation of youth leadership development is Oprah Winfrey's Leadership Academy for Girls, which is located in South Africa. And so part of what we noticed is that out of these almost 300 institution, institutions, or excuse me, out of these um, almost 300 initiatives, youth leadership initiatives, about one out of every six of them had established a school. But interestingly enough, only 14% of the young people that we engaged through surveys or 42 youth had actually had access to these selective institutions. And so what I want to um, ask you to note here is that there is a sort of mismatch between the level of investment in these forms of leadership development and who actually has access to them. And so to sum up some of the findings on the sort of global leadership of academy, excuse me, some of the findings on the sort of landscape of global youth leadership development, some of what we found is some contradictions that we are still trying to understand. Part of what the data is revealing is that there are uneven structures of youth leadership that are deeply dependent on global, corporate, philanthropic, and non-governmental partners even when they claim to be homegrown and based in Africa. Another thing that we're noticing about these uh, programs is that there's a pattern of elite driven theories of social change, neoliberal, entrepreneurial, neoliberal entrepreneurialism and corporate leadership models derived from Western business schools. And another thing that we were surprised to find is that about 78% of these African youth leadership programs are sponsored by institutions with headquarters that are outside of Africa or require travel abroad. And so what I want you to take away from this is some questions really about whose interests are being served with these structures of youth leadership development. One of the things that was quite curious in our analytical process is noticing how much corporate, philanthropic, and nonprofit actors were invested in these forms of youth leadership development. Even when they claimed to be sort of based on the continent, there were often all of these um, international networks of power and financial relationships that were a part of that. Another thing we found is that pedagogically, much of what was being taught in these youth leadership development programs was actually derived from Western business schools. Uh, and so I think that might raise some questions about, you know, what kinds of frameworks and paradigms of leadership are being cultivated within these programs. And then, of course, if three quarters of the programs require young people to leave the continent, that also raises some important questions. And so as you'll see on the bottom left-hand side, part of these findings have been published um, in a paper last year that I co-authored co with my former doctoral student, Dr. Christiana Callan Kelly. And part of how we frame this is, is as contradictions of Africa's leadership pipeline. And one of the things, just to put a fine point on this, that um, we found that some of the people who are behind um, rolling out these leadership development programs sometimes hold is very um, clear uh, perspectives on who these programs are for and who they are not for. So um, very shortly after the establishment of the African Leadership Academy, which is the school in Johannesburg we started with, uh, the vice president of the institution at the time, he was um, interviewed on the local news and he said, the, we are not a school for poor kids. We are a school for talented Africans. And so 
I think um, the idea that poor kids cannot be talented Africans raises some questions about the kind of theories of change that these um, youth leadership programs are imagining and enacting. And so through these five, part of what I'm attempting to argue in this work is that institutionalized African youth leadership development, it's expansive, it's rapidly national phenomenon. But more than a phenomenon, it's a convergence of interventions and investments which are attempting to shift power in the African continent. And so a question that I'm still seeking to understand and for whose benefit, right? And so to begin to understand this question of interest and benefit of youth leadership development, the next themselves. So I'll just share very briefly an overview um, of the number of young people that we connected with. So far in the study, um, we have engaged with 255 self-identified youth leaders from 24 African countries through interviews, focus groups, and qualitative surveys. This research phase is still ongoing, but our data analysis has surfaced some of the opportunities and challenges youth face in seeking leadership experience, as well as their perspectives on the benefits and limitations of current approaches to youth leadership development. So, just to provide a, a tiny preview of some of what young people had to share with us in the survey, the interview data, part of what they talked about was a positive personal impact and a questionable collective impact. One um, alumnus from the Young African Leadership Institute, which is the Obama um, created initiative, told us in an interview that I wanted to have exposure to go see people in the developed world do things. And so part of what they were talking about was how this these leadership development opportunities created avenues for exposure and new experiences. Something else that was quite positive is that quite a number of the young people that we interviewed talked about its Pan-African nature. And what they were talking about there is the positive value of forming relationships with peers from other African countries and regions for the first time. But I must say that these young folks had some questions about the politics and intentions of these youth leadership development investments. One um, young leader said in a focus group, it's as if these programs are just looking at young talent, and after they get it, what happens to the people? People are just being shipped here, and then who's going back? Who's doing what? And so part of what they're talking about here is precisely this dynamic of young people being removed or, you know, removed from their home communities to go learn how to be a leader in other parts of the world. Um, another way that the young people in this particular focus group question this was, why do we have to leave Africa to learn? So I want to share another story here, which I think brings into um, relief some of these contradictions, right? And so I want to share some insights from one interlocutor, Jibula, the young man I got to know as a student leader in Nigeria who went on to pursue a leadership development opportunity in South Africa, and he later became a research collaborator on this project. Now, I interviewed Jibola in 2019, a few years ago, over Skype at the time. Um, we've actually had many conversations about this since then, but at the time, I'd known him for about eight years. He was finishing a master's in political science in South Africa through the Mandela Road Scholarship which funds graduate study for African youth who in the program's language have already assumed leadership and made an impact. And during my field work stint in South Africa that I discussed earlier, where I visited the ALA for this professional development experience, I made a point to visit Jubala at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, which is in Durban in South Africa. When I interviewed him as part of the study about a year after I, I visited him in South Africa, he shared midway through our interview the following. 
this leadership pipeline thing. I'm beginning to suspect how vacuous it is, you know? This was quite surprising for me to hear because Jubala is was actually participating in the leadership pipeline himself. So I was a, a bit shocked to hear him articulate this idea of it being vacuous. So he continues, so a lot of these leadership programs are usually looking for, okay, what organization did you found? Where did you school? You know, that sort of thing. So basically, when you have this leadership pipeline, you find a lot of people who are versed in leadership. Then you get, on the other hand, people who really worked it, who send their own sister or siblings to school. Now, these ones don't have the chance to maybe start the right life project, you know, fancy projects. I mean, for them, it's really leadership if you get what I'm saying. So part of what Jibula is doing here is he's making a distinction between people who are a part of this formal leadership pipeline, who have been recognized as these leaders in the making, and then he's also differentiating people who are doing the work of leadership who may not have the training or the opportunity to have their leadership legitimized. He continued, when I look at the people who after one fellowship, they get another fellowship, I realize a lot of them came from the pipeline. Whereas, for example, there was a scholar who didn't apply for a leadership fellowship because he was having problems at the university because of the, of the fact that he was a protest leader. So there were consequences attached to it, whereas there were a lot of incentives to keeping to the pipeline. And so part of what Jubala is doing here is he's identifying the rewards that are available to people who keep to the pipeline, but may not be taking the kind of risks of youth who are enacting more radical forms of political action, including, for example, what you see pictured on the left hand of the slide, which was um, a protest movement at the, U the University of KwaZulu-Natal, which was a part of the broader Rhodes Must Fall movement, which led to the Fees Must Fall movement in South Africa, which was a struggle for the decolonization of the university and society. And so you see um, a statue of King George, colonizer and benefactor to the university that was defaced by students. And this was a, a very direct challenge to the structures of colonialism, the structures of apartheid, right? But part of what Jubala and many other young people noticed is that the young people who were doing those kind of direct challenges to the system were not encouraged and rewarded in the ways that those who did this sort of institutionalized youth leadership pipeline were. So that brings me to the second project, which I will briefly touch on here, which is the School Protests in Africa Project, which is attempting to document and digitally map school protests. Um, you'll see noted here two of my student collaborators. Um, this is a site, this is a project that also has an interactive research website and database at schoolprotests.com. Um, one of the things that is very um, significant about this work is that to my knowledge, this study has aggregated the first and only cross-national national database of school-based protests in Africa in this period. And so far, we've cataloged over 1,100 incidents of school protest across all 54 African countries, which is quite significant. So what you're seeing here is um, a screenshot of the school protest database that you can interact with on the research website. Um, each of the purple dots represents a protest um, at a school site or engaged in by school actors. And you can click on each of those and learn more about the protest. You can um, have access to um, a news article to tell you more about it. Uh, but in short, part of what I want to point out here about these school protests is that they're happening across Africa, just as they're happening across the world, and they're growing in frequency. We're seeing that students are the ones who are leading these protests. They are um, organizing around important societal issues, such as governance, infrastructure, resources, and political freedom. At the same time, though, and to Jibala's point, student protests are facing significant repression in the form of state violence, 
political imprisonment, and institutional discipline. And one thing I want you to be clear on here is that the growth of institutionalized leadership development that you saw on some of the earlier maps, it's happening in the very same spaces where student protests are the most vibrant. And so part of what I want you to understand about this is that we should understand youth leadership, um, institutionalized youth leadership development as part of a deliberate effort to offset grassroots radical movements with forms of establishment oriented leadership. In other words, it's not a coincidence that institutionalized youth leadership is happening in the places where we're seeing school protests also happen most regularly. So here's where we come to this idea of the youth empowerment paradox that I started with. I hope by now it's a bit clearer what I mean by the youth empowerment um, paradox, but in case it's not, I want to share that part of what this work is attempting to do is join and expand a critical body of scholarship that asks us to interrogate what is empowering about empowerment and also what is beneficial about development and for whom. And so I join a number of scholars who are asking us to really consider these questions. And so in their important analysis of the global turn to youth, um, two scholars, Sukarea and Tanik, they warned us that positive youth development, along with associated set, the along with associated set of concepts of youth participation, leadership, organizing, and activism, they're easily mobilized to present a facade of engagement with radical oppositional grassroots politics. And so part of what they're asking us to consider is the extent to which these kind of institutionalized forms of youth leadership development are actually tapping into sort of grassroots activism that is happening. Another scholar, Su Kwan, who wrote a very important book called Uncivil Youth, which talks about youth empowerment nonprofits in Oakland, California, she notes that empowerment operates as a strategy of self-governance to make the powerless and politically apathetic act on their own behalf but not necessarily to oppose the relations of power that made them powerless. And so part of what she's getting at here is that empowerment can actually offer a rather surface level of uh, leadership development, of access to power, but it doesn't necessarily shift structures or relations of power. And then finally, James Ferguson, who wrote a very important book called The Anti-Politics Machine, he talks about development as an anti-politics machine, which depoliticizes everything it touches, whisking political realities out of sight. And so to close, the tensions that I've been describing here between institutionalized leadership and grassroots organizing and protests are relevant to a larger set of issues within Black excuse me, within global social movements, many of which are youth-led and subject to high levels of state repression and co-optation. We've seen this in the movement for Black Lives. We see this in other current youth-led and grassroots mobilizations. And I want to affirm here that this is not mere speculation. These dynamics are happening in real time. One recent example of this is in the October 2020 youth-led NSARS protest movement against police brutality in Nigeria. This was the largest protest movement in Nigeria in generations, and it was led by youth, young women in particular. As you see with the image on the left, one of the major slogans of NSARS was, we have no leaders, which is a very clear critique of the establishment. However, after the protest was violently brutalized and suppressed by the government, a few months later, the Ford Foundation announced the Nigeria Youth Futures Fund. They've promised to raise $15 million to increase leadership capacity. And what I want to say here in closing is that on the surface, this might appear to be another form of empowerment. But part of what I'm attempting to argue is that understanding the friction between institutionalized leadership from above and grassroots activism from below, 
it actually shows us the potential de-radicalizing effects of institutionalized youth empowerment in an era of global youth uprisings. And so part of what I want future work to do, and certainly other folks to join me in thinking about, is who stands to benefit from youth empowerment, right? And how do we ensure that youth-led demands for change are not undermined by donor and NGO-driven forms of development? And so with that, I will close and thank you very much for your attention and turn it over to uh, Dr. Gassman. Thank you. Oh my goodness. That was so good. I just have to say it was just, you know, I've seen you present so many times before, but you just get better and better and better. And uh, it was just, it was really wonderful. And I think, um, um, oh, so sorry. Um, I guess my, uh, I didn't have my camera up. Someone gave me a little heads up with that. Um, but I, I also wanted to say that someone in the, in, in uh, sending in uh, Q&A agreed and said, um, not a question, just an absolutely amazing presentation and that they've learned a lot. So um, so thank you, thank you so much, Crystal. And I wanted to also ask a few of the questions that came up. And um, one of them uh, is, uh, and I also would love to know more about this. Uh, can you talk more about, you know, why you're so committed and passionate about this work? Mm. Thank you. I, I actually love this question. Um, and I think, you know, it's important for us as scholars to, to be transparent about how and why we come to the work that we do. And so I'll say there are two main reasons. One is that, you know, for a very long time, um, almost 20 years, I have been working with young people, young leaders in a variety of contexts. And part of what young people are trying to attempt to do is to change the world, right? And to make to transform their societies for the better and to create more space for themselves, for the future. And part of what they are finding challenging is that there's not often a lot of space for them in the corridors of power, the formal corridors of power. And so paying attention to um, the relationship between the political establishment and who is able to get resources, who is able to get access, it tells us a lot about the space that will be created for young people, right? And at the same time, when we look at the ways that some young people are punished, right, for the ways that they choose to, to um, contest, to transform the system, we have to look at the political and social implications of that. And so I think that is very relevant to our current political moment where we're seeing the growth of movements all around the world, but we're also seeing a lot of backlash and a lot of repression. And so my work is really trying to understand those kind of contradictions and nuances. And the second thing I'll say is that I come from a youth leadership background. Um, I am a community organizer, and these are dynamics that I see um, firsthand in movements where the influx of foundation dollars, nonprofitization, you know, there's a very famous book by Insight called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. And so there's been a longstanding critique about the role of these outside institutions, philanthropy, corporate interests in reshaping the directions of movements. And so um, this work also is informed by that, because I do think there are very important political stakes for the ways that these different influences are coming together in this work and also in, in larger processes for social change. Yeah, I'm so glad you talked about that. When you were presenting, I was thinking about um, when I was uh, writing my dissertation and in the archives of all of these foundations. And I found all of this evidence of foundations wanting to shut down civil rights movement. And yeah. so they would pump in money. And so as you were talking, I was like, oh, God. you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, no, oh. this is this is actually a historic dynamic. Um, right. Megan Francis, one of the things she talks about is the civil rights movement. And she analyzes that as movement capture mm -hmm. and the ways that many of the entities that we get funding from for our research were a big part of reshaping the direction of the struggles from the six, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s into nonprofits and sort of corporate philanthropic organizations. And so this is not a new problem. This is not a new issue, but we have to think about 
you know, what is specific or different or particular about how it's taking shape in this moment. Absolutely. Another question that I was thinking about as you were talking as well, um, and uh, I, I can't remember if, I mean, we've known each other for a while, but I can't remember if you remember that I've done quite a bit of work in South Africa. And so it was interesting. Um, I was actually there while the Rhodes Mutts Fall was taking place. And I was just wondering, um, do, do, you, do you feel like there um, was a significant ripple effect, you know, in all across other areas? And um, it seems like there's a bit of that, right? But um, do you think it's even more powerful than we might have assumed or that especially people in the area um, might have assumed the ripple effect beyond South Africa, right? You know, going uh, uh, um, across the continent. If you could talk more about that. I actually really love this question. So thank you for asking it. Um, and one of the reasons that I think this question is important is because, you know, sometimes, you um, because I do research, a significant amount of research in Africa, sometimes people don't understand the relevance or the significance. And part of what is, is very important to me to continue to emphasize is that there are all of these relationships across struggles and across movements, right? And so, for example, if you look at Roads Must Fall, which started in 2015, here in the United States, we were inspired by Roads Must Fall. If you think about the, the protests from 2016 and all of the movements to remove monuments, that was directly inspired by Roads Must Fall in South Africa. Yeah. And then similarly, if you look at Black Lives Matter in the U.S., it has been tremendously influential in other parts of the world throughout the entire African continent in, in many parts of the world where people are thinking about state violence and racial injustice. And so um, I think it's very important for us to understand that there are all of these global relationships. There are also all of these global networks of power, right? So the same folks who are funding youth leadership development here in the U.S. are also doing that in the African continent, right? And so you know, we see the relationships between policing, for example, all across the world, higher education all across the world. And so I think it's just very important for us to um, to understand that the world is not as siloed as we think and that there are all of these very important connections and resonances, both in institutions and structures, but also in ways that people are attempting to make change. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that too. I remember one time when I um, took, a, I was taking a group of students to South Africa and we were in the apartheid museum and we walked in and the, it's first, incredible. Thing, the first thing they saw though was a special exhibition on American apartheid. And they almost, you know, like they, they were like, what is this? And what it showed them is that some of the techniques that were used by blacks to um, by black people to um, counter uh, apartheid were were learned from the civil rights movement, right? Absolutely. And vice versa. So absolutely, so they, yeah. They, and they in fact, learned. I was yeah. I was at the apartheid museum this summer myself for this for I think that was my second or third time visiting, and you actually learned that the segre the the apartheid technique segregation they were globally shared. Yeah. Right. Like there's quite literally a connection between Jim Crow and yeah. apartheid South Africa. It's not conjecture. It's it's absolutely connected. But then also, you know, the anti-apartheid struggle was a global struggle. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, if we see the way people have rallied around Black Lives Matter around the world. Right. So many people are drawing connections across movements and across contexts. And so it's very important for us to recognize where that work is happening. Absolutely. And I love the way that you pointed to, um, you know, how relevant your work is, even if people think that it might not be right in, in, to, to the United States. It's very relevant here. So um, we got time for one last question. I'm just going to ask it. I know we're sort of out of time, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I think it's so important. Um, uh, I want to get uh, a PhD and do work in this area. Do you have any advice? And I want to add, are you taking students? Yes, I am very excited to be taking students. Um, please apply. <laughs> I'm very excited to be working with more students. And in fact, um, as you can see with my projects, I work very closely with students in my work, um, which I think is a very important part of the training process. Uh, but for me, 
the choice to focus on a PhD is a very serious decision, right? Like you're get, you know, investing years of your time, um, year, you know, resources that you could be gaining if you were um, gainfully employed in other contexts. And so you should really embark on that choice um, with a great amount of deliberation. And so for me, um, the decision to embark upon a PhD, I think you have to have a clear why. <laughs> you have to have a clear set of interests. You know, it's wonderful to, to read books and to, you know, study all day, but that's not all that's in, a part of the PhD process, right? You are learning how to do original research and to make uh, an original intellectual contribution. And so I think it's very important for all prospective PhD students to get clear about what drives you? What do you want to learn? What, Where do you want to make your contribution? And then to seek out programs that can be supportive of that, mentors who can be supportive of that. Um, you know, the, the PhD um, selection process, the institutional selection process is highly consequential. So you should make sure to do your research and to also um, find a context that can really help you grow and give you the support, the intellectual support, the financial support, um, and, the, and the, you know, social supports that you need to do the kind of work that you want to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've got lots uh, more comments and a few more questions. And I'm sure that if you reach out to Dr. Crystal Strong, she would be happy to answer them. But I want to say thank you so much, Crystal. Um, great, great job. And um, for those of you who uh, tuned in today, this is just one of several uh, presentations that we have in a new series that's focused on the wonderful research of our faculty at Rutgers GSE. So stay tuned. We also will be sending everyone a copy of the presentation so that you can use it in classes and uh, and share it and learn uh, as much as possible um, from uh, this great presentation. Thank you so much again, Crystal. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Take awesome. care, everybody.